Hi, this is Dr. Mark Sell. This is the fifth talk in a series on what makes for a good psychotherapy session. Title is Infant Autism and Early Interventions. I'm not a child analyst, but I am very interested in child development and how disturbances in child development affect people as they move through different um, stages of their life. Recently in talk four, we looked at parent-child relationships and the impact of early therapeutic interventions through the lens of researcher uh, Dr. Beatrice Beebe. We saw how a mother's early experience as a child affected her capacity to connect with her nine-month-old infant Cecil. Once she resolved her transference, in other words, we talked about transference in the first three talks, but uh, that's an experience where the mother is really not seeing her son because she's seeing the experience she had with her rejecting an unattuned mother. Uh, so once she resolved that, she could uh, really love her son. As she wrote to the therapist, having discovered Cecil, I fell in love with him. Uh, Dr. Beebe's um, other research showed, that, showed how the kind, the kind of interactions between mother and child at four months of age could predict a disorganized attachment at 12 months. This was a very reliable statistic and prediction that they had and they found in their research. Research has shown that the quality of the early interactions with mother and infants will affect the development of the brain and the emotional and cognitive development of the infant. Dr. Acquaroni is a specialist in infant autism. She is from the Parent Infant Clinic in London and I met her when she was giving a workshop at the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis several months ago. We uh, talked later. Um, she's a lovely lady and uh, we are, have been in contact uh, since then uh, through emails. The title of her presentation was Premature Birth, Premature Trauma, Developing Reflective Function Through Integration of Painful Experiences. There was a trauma, indeed, a trauma related to the birth of this infant in terms of a very difficult and premature delivery, which had a severe impact on both parent and child. In the video we see uh, opens up with the child uh, laying on her back, she's about three months old, and uh, Dr. Acroni and, and the mother are in the room. And uh, the infant is, uh, it's very disturbing because the infant is not making any connection. It's, it seems very distressed only in the sense that it's disconnected. Um, it's not fussing or anything, but it doesn't see either people in the room. It's looking kind of way in, in, into space. Um, and uh, Dr. Acaroni and, and is sitting is standing alongside the mother. Um, some of the typical signs of infant autism are uh, the lack of eye contact with the mother. The child is often subdued, doesn't cry. The child is not interested in the mother's attentions. Uh, there's other early signs of infantile or, or infant autism um, on Dr. Acaroni's website, infantmentalhealth.com if you'd like to look that up. So the therapist, Dr. Acaroni, intervenes and she says to the mother and the child, at the same time addressing them both, you had a very difficult delivery. At that moment, the mother starts to cry, crying, maybe sobbing. She turned her head away and very upset with the recognition uh, somebody finally is attuned to what she had to go through. And at that moment, when she cries, the baby looks up at her and starts to cry. I mean, it just really gets to me when I think about it. Um, I mean, how many infants are in that position of not being able to have someone to intervene like that? Uh, it's very tragic. I saw on a website there's someone trying to open up uh, low-cost uh, uh, clinics uh, in the United States where these kind of problems can be addressed. Uh, the therapist had empathy and she was attuned to the mother and the child, what they, what they went through. Something awful, awful happened to them, maybe no, that no one recognized, maybe the mother couldn't really address it within herself. Uh, something to be frustrated and even rageful about. If these experiences are not integrated into part of the self, they can be split off and really cause emotional turmoil. Uh, later on in life. I think that's what uh, Dr. Acroni means by integrating pain painful experiences. It was good for the mother and the baby to cry, 
Uh, the mother puts a pacifier in the baby's mouth, uh, also in the video. Uh, I w I'm not so sure if you wanted to comfort the baby, comfort herself, or shut the baby up, uh, because it was difficult for her to experience the pain. But she allowed herself to cry. And I think the part of the problems with pacifiers is that the, the, the infant and the mother has to have to give voice to this tragedy, tragedy that happened to them. And the one way to give voice to it is to cry and to cry together. I mean, sometimes therapists cry with their patients uh, uh, at times when it's so severe. And something, somebody, someone, a patient might give, tell a story about a horrific life experience. And once you've known the patient for a while, it's okay to shed a tear or two, or maybe even sob with them. Interventions like these can save the lives of many parents and their children. Early interventions are important because much of the child's brain develops in the first two to three years of life, and the first two are particularly important, since two-thirds of, of the brain development occurs within this period of time. I'm going to show you a picture of the brain. This is a PET scan, and this is of a healthy, a healthy brain, uh, and you hear you see here these two areas right here. I'm going to compare those two areas to the brain PET scan of a Romanian child who was institu institutionalized after, uh, I think, after one month. Uh, and these areas, areas here, the temporal lobes, uh, as you can see, are very inactive right here. So healthy relationships, healthy brains, as Dr. Acaroni would say, uh, the child in the institution didn't have a relationship. That can, they can die from that. Um, so early interventions that occur in the first two years can have a greater impact on a child's development. In terms of the brains of the temporal lobes that we just talked about, uh, let's see where it is here. Well, and anyway, if, if, there's no, if there's no activity, the circuits don't get wired, and, uh, and it calls for mo the, the really the message is that it's really nurture that accounts for healthy development of the brain. And if you don't have enough nurture, uh, you're going to have cognitive impairment uh, uh, very likely uh, along the way. Now this is from Dr. Acroni's website. During infancy, the brain experiences explosive growth. The social engagement and the speech areas in the brain develop rapidly between birth and the age of two. How these areas develop is impacted by the combination of nature, brain developing neural circuits, and nurture, the child's experiences, which drive and determine which circuits survive. This is a life and death issue. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's, there's truth to that. It is overwhelming to have a child that's not functioning and parents often know there is something wrong, but it can't be verified. Uh, often their concerns are not taken seriously. They need a specialist to diagnose and recommend treatment. Diagnosis is very important. For instance, the early signs of autism can be confused with ADHD. It's very important to be attuned to a child's needs. That seems like, um, you know, yeah, sure, everybody knows that. But sometimes not everybody uh, delivers, um, and because not because they they not ill intentioned, it's just that because they might be limited in their in their ability to deliver because perhaps they weren't uh, didn't have enough empathy in their lives to be able to have it for for their children. Um, development depends in part on a caregiver being able to sense a child's feelings and to mirror back to the child, those expressions and moods. That's very important. Being attuned also involves sensing the child's experience of distress, both verbal and nonverbal, and responding appropriately to the child's needs. If there's too much delay, uh, uh, then it's too, too frustrating for the child. If there's, well, on the other hand, if there's too immediate uh, uh, response, then uh, that might be a problem too, depending uh, on, the, uh, on the child. Um, but it's always uh, better to err in the favor of uh, uh, greater comfort than uh, uh, less comfort and uh, nurturance for a child. I worked with a person who blamed herself for not being able to socialize. This is what this reminds me of. Her history revealed her family moved from one town to the other, constantly changing schools. Her parents criticized her for not making friends in school. 
I said to her that it's, it must have been very hard to be the new kid in the school. She cried often with me about this throughout therapy. Eventually, compassion for herself took the place of self-attacks. And we talked about self-attacks and how if you're attacked and criticized as a child, it turns inward and uh, the therapeutic treatment is to help um, uh, turn that back uh, and reverse that so the uh, anger goes into the object world rather than t into the ego, uh, rather than staying in the ego. It's a very important modern analytic intervention. I can't explain it right now, but you can read talks, uh, listen to talks one, two, and three to get more of a sense of what I'm saying. Dr. Acquaroni writes of the myths of autism. Myth one, children with autism can, cannot be helped. In our experience of 25 plus years working with autistic behavior in young children and infants, children that underwent our program and follow on treatment have learned to speak, to be toilet trained, control states of anxiety and panic without resorting to stereotypical behaviors. To go to mainstream nurseries and schools, they were able to go to mainstream, mainstream nurseries and schools and develop within the range of normality. Myth, children with autism don't have a mind of their own because they don't speak. Children with autism have a personality and a way of reacting that is personal and unique like any other child. Myth, children with autism cannot empathize or feel for other people. Individual treatments of children with autism show that they are more, more likely to be overwhelmed by how much they perceive of other people's emotions. That is why in the Autistic Child Program we try to help them disentangle their emotional perceptions and understand them so that they can learn to process them differently. There is a, there is a video on, on my uh, therapy for the heart. It's called Autistic Teddies and this is from Dr. Acaroni's, um, Acaroni's, um, I mispronounce her name sometimes. Um, it's, it's from her uh, website and it's called Autistic Teddies and it's worth a look. It's uh, uh, looking at the early signs of autism through the use of uh, interactive teddy bears. So it's right up there on, under favorites uh, on my site. So to summarize points from this and talks that came before this, in our relationships with others in our past experiences, they often affect our current reactions and choices in life. The more aware we are of what unconsciously pushes us, the more control we have of our choices. Then we can have less of an inclination to repeat behaviors that are often self-destructive and unfulfilling and destructive to those that we love. A good example is Cecil's mother who came to understand how she could not see Cecil for, her, for who he was. Cecil is becoming much more famous with these tapes, I think, uh, because of her transference reactions that had to do with how she was raised by her mother. In other words, Mrs. C's mother was not attuned to her. And, uh, and therefore, Mrs. C could not, had difficulty being attuned to Cecil. And uh, that could go on and on from generation to generation. So we want to make sure that things aren't passed down by, uh, if we feel we have a, a problem in a certain area of within ourselves or working with our, being with our children, that therapy can help because it can bring to awareness those unconscious forces that uh, most people don't recognize because 70% often of our life is uh, lived in the realm of the unconscious. I'm not sure if that statistic is actually correct, but that's my take on it. I work with many couples in my practice. They are understandably anxious about how to raise their children and often fight in front of their children, not understanding their impact on their fighting on their young infants or on their unborn inf or babies. Um, often a little information about what can impact the fetus can be very helpful. Sometimes I tell the story, um, I don't want to make people feel um, like they're on the spot or they're doing something wrong, but sometimes they like the information about the cat in the hat how um, the cat in the hat, when it was read to uh, a mother uh, in the last six weeks of, of pregnancy, uh, the, uh, once the child was born, uh, the child could recognize cat in the hat and differentiate it from other stories that were read. It's amazing what goes on uh, before, uh, before a child is born. Holy. That's why it's so so good to be sensitive to these things and not scream, fight, loud loud sounds will startle, uh, startle the 
can startle uh, the baby and, and the fetus. I mean, it can, a lot of things happening, which we more, more and more we're realizing uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the effects of, uh, uh, on, on the fetus. So sometimes they, they like that because it gives them a feeling and a sense of what, what's happening in a very concrete way, that story. Other times they need to work hard to become aware that although they promised they would never treat their children as they were treated, there is a force within, within them greater than conscious knowledge that stands in the way of what they know rationally. A big difference between what we know, uh, what we, what we know intellectually and what, what, what's going on with us uh, on an irrational level. One of my YouTube channel survivors, <laughs> survivors, <laughs> they could survive this tape. That was a good slip, I like that one. One of my YouTube channel subscribers asked if many of, I hope you're, I hope you're getting more out of this than surviving it. Um, you can write me and let me know. I like all your comments. Uh, asked if uh, many of my channel followers have, <laughs> have similar anxieties to hers. I like this question uh, because what it uh, brings up in my mind is that we have everything in, 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 uh, in us. I like that. I've never liked the diagnoses because they always separate people. They're helpful in some way, but I think they're, we, we experience them as judgments. And if we look at everything potentially in us, we can, we can say we're all potentially borderline or schizophrenic or obsessive compulsive, given any stressor that we might have in our life. And, uh, you know, that's human. That's like, it's, it's accepting who we are and not projecting out into the world that they are the mentally ill, and the mentally ill are all in an institution. Well, I know some mentally ill people who seem to be mentally ill to me that are running the country, so I don't know about uh, they're all in institutions, and we know that. I mean, I hope you know it. Uh, we are all uh, human, therefore we can suffer many, many things, and that's okay as long as we, they don't interfere with our life too much and we can get help. Um, Dr. Lucas, I thank for that kind of perspective on uh, of, of problems, Dr. Jerry Lucas, who trained me, and also his wife, uh, Dr. Marie Lucas, who also talked about her her word for it was schizophrenic bits. That we all have them in us. Uh, I want to thank you for um, surviving this <laughs> surviving this video, and uh, I'd like you to comment on it if you could. I've survived it. I, I'm pretty happy with it so far. Uh, please comment and subscribe. If you subscribe. Um, the big advantage is that you can, uh, you'll get my wonderful videos uh, when they're uploaded to my site. You'll receive notification about that. Uh, so I want to thank you for spending the time with me today. Uh, this is Dr. Mark Sell, and again, please comment on the page if you, if you'd like to subscribe and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you. And uh, I also make a video two a month on the average so far. I think I haven't counted it. Uh, and I appreciate you listening and I look forward to uh, talking again with you. All right, bye-bye.